How are you, Bob? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to uh, introduce a very dear friend of mine and former colleague, Father Sergius Halverson, who uh, is now at St. Vladimir's Seminary in New York State, where he developed an online learning program there. He is the former director of online learning at Holy Apostles College and Seminary in Cromwell, Connecticut, where I currently work. Uh, Father Serge started there in uh, the early 2000s, took over as the distance learning director in 2004 until 2011, implemented many positive changes for us, especially in terms of technology. And he's gotten us to the point where we are now. We had 75 students online when I started there. We're up between five and 600 now. And Father Serge had a tremendous role in that growth. So Father Serge, welcome. And we look forward to your, in, your presentation. Thank you, Bob. Thank you so much. Very gracious introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen because I made a few um, host disabled attendee screen sharing. Host, can you enable attendee screen sharing? Uh, let's see here. Let me try again. There we go. Uh, and I'll share these slides. Let's see. Okay. Um, just for ease of, of simplicity or uh, uh, simplicity of technology, I'm going to uh, I'm going to share the screen like this. So you'll see the the extra bits of my PowerPoint uh, application, but it's a little bit easier. Um, so, what I'd like to do is just share a few thoughts and ideas um, that I have regarding the role of vulnerability and trust in terms of building communities of teachers and learners. Uh, and I want to say at the very beginning that you know this is a work in progress and that I very much look forward to your insights and feedback um, because uh, I don't claim to be the expert in this, but really just these are some reflections that I've had um, over the years that I've been involved in, uh, uh, in teaching both face-to-face -face courses and also uh, teaching courses uh, online uh, and also being the director of, of two different programs that do um, online learning and hybrid learning. So uh, vulnerability and trust, what, what role do they have in building uh, communities of teachers and learners? Uh, really important uh, because one of the, I don't know, one of the axioms that I've lived by um, for at least a decade, if not more, is that the primary uh, metric uh, and if I'm incorrect on this, if this has changed, um, then I'm more than happy to be corrected. But um, my understanding is that that the primary metric uh, from a student perspective as to whether or not they, they uh, stay in a program with online learning is whether or not they feel like they're part of a community. So the students who really feel like they're part of a community, they're much more likely to stay in the program and bring it to completion. Whereas students who don't feel like they're part of a community uh, are much more likely to drop out. Um, Sebastian, did you want to add a comment on this? I just clicked in. Oh, no. Um, I just turned back on my um, video so that you could see that I was nodding in agreement. Um, oh, excellent. It, it's, a, it's the same thing uh, with uh, religious uh, communities. Um, those uh, where the sisters or the brothers don't feel like they're a significant part of the community uh, may not stay. Uh, but if they do right. say, on community basis, they not only stay, but they grow and they thrive. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Um, so uh, the, the way I'd like to start into this is to, just to look at um, two paradigms for relationship. Um, the first paradigm would be hierarchical. Um, and this is, when I'm talking about relationships here, uh, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm gonna be brought bringing in examples from the broader world, but also these, I think these apply very much in terms of uh, uh, academic work and uh, groups of teachers and learners. So there's a hierarchical kind of relationship where everybody understands themselves to be greater or lesser than somebody else in the group. Um, and again, this is kind of an extreme. Uh, and these are just, again, this is kind of a, 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 a what's the word? Uh, it's a, a dichotomy. So I, I'm, I'm presenting this as a di dichotomy and I'm sure there are any number of ways that one could critique this. Um, but just for the sake of argument, um, follow with me for a minute here. So there's this hierarchical kind of relationship. So in that paradigm, my goal is to ascend the hierarchy. Um, in other words, uh, whatever I'm doing within the community, my goal is to become the most powerful or the most knowledgeable or the wealthiest or whatever it might be, because there's always that hierarchy. Um, my relationship to others is defined um, by whether I'm greater or lesser 
than someone else based on any number of metrics. Um, one of the, uh, we can see this, this hierarchical relationship um, in education um, very strongly in kind of the fear of failure motivation strategy. I'm sure we've all heard that story, you know, an elite program, whether it's a, a military academy or an engineering program or something, and where the professor says, all right, to the in in incoming class, okay, look to your left and look to your right. And by the end of this program, you know, two thirds of the students will wash out. Um, and so it's kind of that, that, that fear of failure uh, so the idea is um, you really need to struggle to make sure that you cut the mustard. And that's very much a hierarchical sense of, of kind of identification. Um, one of the, the other things that I think is very, one of the big dangers uh, that, that results from this particular approach is what I call a lone wolf ministry, where a um, uh, person, whoever that might be, whether they be ordained or whether they be a lay person, they really understand, they, they're formed with this idea that I am the sole expert. My idea is to be the expert in this particular thing, and, uh, and I'm really the only one. And so that's a, that's a great, there's a risk there. Um, uh, let's, I'm just going to continue to the end of the slide and then uh, uh, I can open it up for comments or clarifications or if anyone has an argument with what I've said. Then the other perspective would be more of a communal sense of, of relationship, that, that fundamentally we are all equal, that our goal uh, as a community of teachers and learners is to achieve a shared objective. Um, the, the kind of operating factors in, in this communal kind of relationship would be understanding. Do we understand one another? Are we communicating clearly? Um, one of service, are we serving one another? Vulnerability, are we, uh, do we make ourselves vulnerable to one another? Um, and also, do we trust one another? Um, so those are profoundly, I mean, they're not mutually exclusive, but they're, they're substantially different than this kind of hierarchical um, uh, form of relationship. Um, another one is, you know, we are undertaking a shared work, um, not only in this course, uh, uh, not only in this course or program, but overall shared work in ministry, so that ministry is not just kind of a lone wolf exercise, rather it's, um, from, from a Christian perspective, it's building up the body of Christ. Um, and there are a few, you know, any number of examples from, from scripture, um, and just two I've, I've cited here was you know, how uh, uh, Jesus sent the, the apostles or the disciples two by two when he did send them out um, uh, during his ministry, uh, and also his message that when, when, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So again, this idea of community, that it's not something, ministry isn't something we just do alone. Um, so before I go on to my next slide, any questions or any concerns about what I've just shared there, or just kind of laid out as a one framework to kind of look at how we might understand relationships. No? All right, moving on. Um, so uh, just, just a couple of uh, uh, pictures here. So you think about hierarchical relationships, you could think about who's the most powerful. Here's a statue of a Roman emperor. Um, in, a, in education, um, just the same thing, right? This is the most knowledgeable. Who has the most expertise? Um, you know, who is the one who knows the answer? Um, and certainly that hierarchical uh, uh, understanding, definitely a, you can find that in, in uh, education and academia all over the place. Um, or, and you can also find it in terms of, of who's the wealthiest. Um, this is a little image from the stock market. I suppose that's not necessarily a great image on this particular day for wealth, uh, since the stock market has really tanked, but you get the idea. Um, so these are some of the most common ways that, that we relate to one another, um, and I'm not sure they're necessarily uh, the most effective for building a community of teachers and learners. Um, and then I would, I would suggest that a more communal relationship or a, an understanding of relationship at is perhaps more authentic, uh, certainly to, uh, to the Christian tradition. And the idea that ministry is the work of building up the body of Christ. Here you have um, an Eastern Orthodox um, icon of Pentecost. Um, and here you have um, the 12 disciples. And here you have Mary, the mother of God. And if you look very closely, you can see there are little tongues of flame um, on the heads uh, of the, uh, the apostles. This, this initial icon you know, of the church as, as a community. Um, Okay, um, so now when you talk about vulnerability, okay, so what, what, is, what, do I, what am I talking about there? So uh, within, again, within the Christian tradition, um, the primary, uh, the focus for uh, God's revelation of who God is uh, to the world 
also God's revelation of God's power to the world is fundamentally in the crucifixion. Here's another uh, Eastern Orthodox uh, icon. And Sebastian, um, you'll, uh, you'll note that I am following uh, ethics of, uh, of online teaching and learning that I've, um, I've given the appropriate reference for all of these images. Uh, so I just want, I thank you for, you know, you taught me a lot about this. Anyway. I'm very um, proud of you. Not, not only did you uh, give the appropriate reference, uh, but your images are in the public domain. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, if, I, if I'd been building a website, I would have, um, uh, what's that trick where you, um, uh, you just create the, uh, uh, there's another trick. But since this is a different thing, I have to make sure they're in the public domain. Anyway, so the vulnerability of the crucified Messiah, um, just a few things uh, from, uh, from the Gospels that, you know, really emphasize this idea of vulnerability. Um, Jesus says, you know, that there are those who are supposed to rule over the Gentiles that lord it over them and they're great men exercise authority over them. So this would be this hierarchical relationship. Um, and then Jesus says, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be a slave of all. For the Son of Man also came to be not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And also there's um, uh, Jesus's words, uh, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and lean and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So there's certainly a strong, uh, or I would even say that at the heart of the gospel is this idea of vulnerability, uh, and that ultimately, uh, if God sees fit to reveal God's power and God's authority through vulnerability, uh, and that is the way that the community of the church is ultimately established, then that should also stand as a pretty good example for us in the way that we would build communities of teachers and learners, specifically when, within the context of, of Christian education and online education. Okay, moving on to the next slide. So when you talk about vulnerability and trust, here are some challenges. Um, the first one is grades and assessment, right? I mean, we have to give people grades, right? Well, now, of course, there's there is a strategy whereby, uh, and my, I've been a constant kind of thorn in the side of uh, my, ac my, um, my colleagues um, advocating for a paradigm where there are no grades. We just have pass-fail with narrative evaluation. This is actually how my uh, undergrad alma mater, the University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, at least when I was there, that was the norm. Um, they didn't have grades. They had pass-fail with narrative evaluation. And then you could get grades if you needed to go into grad school. But anyway, that's that's a challenge um, because when you have to give grades, then obviously you know grades can immediately do you have an A or do you have a B, um, and it kind of implies this hierarchical alignment. So a few thoughts about that. Um, you know, grades certainly are a measure of individual achievement. We need to, as institutions, as professors, we need to be able to validate that a student actually has met the objectives for the course. Um, whatever those outcomes are for the course, that is important. And I would, uh, perhaps we could, when we're thinking about our grades, we could also include a measure of collaborative success. To what degree does this student um, demonstrate uh, a collaborate, a collaborative activity and have they, have they demonstrated their ability to collaborate so that the group can actually succeed? Um, another possible way to think about this would be to see uh, an element of grades as a measure of servant leadership. To what degree did a student not only um, provide or, uh, demonstrate their own academic expertise, but to what degree were they able to actually serve and, and lead uh, in, a, in a vulnerable Christ-like way uh, amongst their colleagues? So that, that would be one, and, and we can, as soon as I, I only have two more slides and we can throw it open for uh, conversation. Oh, I'm doing great. We're only 15 minutes in. Um, Another challenge is uh, theology, dogma, and jurisdiction. Um, so clearly within, you know, it's certainly any Christian tradition and, and broad, more broadly other religious traditions, there are certain non-negotiables. Um, there are certain theological assertions, there's dogma, there, there are certain jurisdiction, ju jurisdictional boundaries um, that often fall along dogmatic uh, lines. And so that's a reality. But what I would say, is acknowledging that um, we can um, uh, explore or exploration of nuances within a doctrinal tradition. So the point, the reason that, that this can be a challenge is because 
if we're looking again at that solely kind of hierarchical form of relationship, it's like, okay, do you, are you able to kind of repeat accurately the party line? And that's important. There is something to be said for that. But if that's the only thing, if that's the only kind of measure, or if that's the primary um, rubric for, for building the community, then it's like, it's, uh, it can set you up for, for the, Kind of division but then if you think all right we have these non-negotiables but then how are we able as a community to explore the nuances within that doctrinal tradition um uh, that's one op opportunity another one would be to look not only at the ability to repeat uh, a correct doctrine but to say okay now how do we apply um that dogma how do we apply that theology in ministry is there any number of different ministerial contexts and, um, and how it is applied from place to place, that can vary quite dramatically. Also, um, in the sense of uh, having the, the classroom or having the class, the community, be a safe space for difficult discussion. Um, because that's one of the things that we really do, we emphasize to a great deal in our Doctor of Ministry program, is to say that um, this is a safe place for you to ask hard questions. Um, because one of the things that really minimizes uh, community and that maximizes fear is when people are afraid that their colleagues are going to jump down their, their, their shirts or jump down their throats um, because they have asked a question that's, you know, outside the norm. Um, again, this is a tricky one to navigate, uh, but, but I think that there, it's, it's possible to do it in a way that's honest and authentic um, and still remain true um, to our the given tradition in which we live. Um, and then the other one, this is also a big, a big challenge, is that when we're talking about these things, very quickly someone can, you know, could, could attack me right now and say, well, you know, Sergius, you are just an anti-intellectual. Um, you are simply trying to, you know, uh, uh, diminish uh, the, the real and important um, role of academic experts, you know, in, in theology or in whatever. Um, and so I would say that it's, I would acknowledge that it's a danger. Anti-intellectualism is always a danger. Um, but I don't think that the two are mutually exclusive. I don't think if we really look at vulnerability and trust as being paradigms for building community, that we have to fall into anti-intellectualism. Um, because what we can still do is we can still uh, be very intellectual in the sense that we um, support and promote rigorous engagement of ideas. If somebody makes an, if somebody presents an idea, to what degree are they able to rigorously defend it and to rigorously articulate it? Um, and to what degree does it stand up a legitimate uh, critique? Uh, and then also the idea that whatever critical feedback is given, this is the last bullet here, critical support, is that, uh, that you can be highly critical uh, of another person's work or another person's idea while being entirely supportive. Because if the ultimate objective is to provide ex exceptionally rigorous critique of someone's work so that the work might be better, that tends to build community. Whereas uh, I've seen any number of, of class environments or even you know, uh, uh, communities of faculty colleagues where the point isn't so much to provide a rigorous critique to improve the other's work, but rather to shoot someone else down and make myself look better, right? So for example, Sebastian comes up with this great idea, and then I just, you know, go at him with, you know, all guns blazing to try to show how stupid or ignorant or, or nonsensical his idea is so that I can look like the expert. And that would be, you know, a, a totally, that, that's a great way to blow up and destroy community. So that's not what I'm talking about here. Um, Let's see. I've been monologuing a lot. I have one more slide, but any questions? I've been throwing a lot out. Questions, comments, concerns? Sebastian. Well, I've got some, um, you know, in terms of the, um, in terms of scaffolding. So uh, yeah. let's say students have had um, bad or mediocre experiences in previous online courses, yeah. and then, then they walk into yours. And right. suddenly you're, at, you're asking them to do things that, you know, they've done it before and they just, it just hasn't ended well. Yeah. Um, how, how do you, uh, would you scaffold uh, or build a, um, a way, uh, a bridge, sort of speak, from where the student is to where you're, you want him to be in your class? Sure. Uh, that's a great question. So let me ask a, just a follow-up. Are you talking about, uh, so you, let's say they've had bad experiences. Are you, is, uh, 
are you talking about bad experiences in the sense that there was no community or are you also talking about uh, another way to look at this would be are you talking about they've been in a class where a professor or the whoever was leading the class really tried to build community based on vulnerability and trust but it just failed it was like a it was like a washout Right. I, I guess, uh, however you want to uh, consider a bad experience. I mean, it's a both and. Um, okay, sure. Uh, so, uh, no, no problem, yeah. Yeah, what, what you're trying to do is get the students to a certain point where they're willing to be vulnerable and trust in exactly. the, in the uh, exactly. teaching and learning environment, the relationship with the other students, the community. Exactly. Yes, yes. So, uh, so the first thing, yeah, great question. So the first thing I would suggest is take time to ask questions of the students to find out what their experiences have been. Um, and you can ask very direct, you know, what, what has been your best experience in terms of being a student and feeling like you're part of a community? And, and then ask for specifics, you know, describe it, you know, as much as you're willing to. And then also, uh, uh, so asking for the best case scenario and asking for a worst case scenario. You know, what was an experience you had in a class that really made you feel like an outsider? Um, and then, and, that, and so you're, I love your, your metaphor of, of scaffolding or you know, bridge work. How do you get a student from one kind of experience to something different? Well, you have to know where they are, right? You can't put scaffolding from, from nowhere to somewhere. You have to find out where it is. Then the other thing too, I th that's really important, and this is kind of uh, anticipating my next slide. Um, I'll just put it up here. And it's actually this third one, lead by example. Um, so the idea would be that whatever question I would ask to students regarding their experiences, I would start out by giving answers to those questions from my own experience. Um, so what I can do then is I can actually show, make myself vulnerable. And I think that's one of the biggest, one of the most important things is that faculty and teachers are willing, again, you have to, and I should have put this on the slide here, I'm, I apologize, but you know, write this in, in, in big red letters, you know, uh, uh, maintaining appropriate boundaries is absolutely critical, okay? I, I, I really want to make sure I state that clearly, and forgive me for not having it in the slide. Um, so with, within the context of maintaining appropriate boundaries, um, when a faculty member is able to make himself or herself vulnerable by kind of sharing, okay, this was my best experience, this was my worst experience, um, that's a great way to invite people into a relationship of trust. Uh, because by me telling you that story, um, now you have heard something about me. Now you know something about kind of my, um, within again, within safe, within appropriate boundaries, you know something about my kind of personal experience. Um, and that invites you then, you know, into, into my, uh, uh, my, my experience. Um, so I'll, I could even do that right now. Um, you know, I was just, I was uh, telling this to, uh, to Bob the other day. You know, one of my, and this is, wasn't necessarily a classroom experience, but it was actually a professional experience within uh, an, uh, an academic institution, um, was when, you know, I was asked to work with someone, and it started out to be a meeting where, um, you know, we were sharing ideas, and we were looking how to find a solution to a difficult, a number of difficult challenges, and finally this person just, you know, put his foot down and said, you know, I don't want to hear your ideas. I don't want to hear what you have to say. We're going to do this no matter what. No matter what you say, it's going to happen. Um, and that was perhaps one of the most off-putting experiences I ever had. Um, you know, it made me want to walk away. It made me think, I never want to deal with you again. It colored all of my experience, all of my interactions that I had um, with that particular colleague for the rest of the time that we worked together. Um, so that kind of heavy handedness, um, you know, it was, it was, uh, really painful. I mean, it was an incredibly painful experience. Um, but, uh, it was very instructive, uh, in that, later, you know, and I, then I've gone on and I've, I've shared that experience with other colleagues. Like when we were dealing with difficult decisions, um, I would say, Hey, wait, let me tell you the story. I once had this meeting with this guy, blah, blah, blah. And this happened. And then I explained the whole thing. And I said, you know, right now we're trying to have a difficult, we're trying to work out something difficult. I don't want to be that guy, right? I don't want to be the guy that just tells you how to do stuff. Um, so that would be an example uh, of how uh, I can make, I think within and maintaining appropriate boundaries, I can make myself a little bit vulnerable um, and, and, and invite uh, my colleagues into the, uh, into the process. Sebastian, that was a great question. And I don't know if my rambling answer was helpful or not. 
No, it is helpful. Basically, um, if I I've heard you correctly, you're saying um, uh, create uh, the space um, where people uh, grow increasingly uh, comfortable with the idea that when they say something, uh, they're not going to be shot down. Um, so the, the big question in a 15-week course is how quickly do you want to ramp, or are we able to ramp up to that uh, in the kinds of spaces that we create? So let's say... Uh, we have a discussion board and uh, we have discussion boards in all 15 weeks Yeah, and we can do whatever we want to with those discussion boards. So like, are the first discussion boards more open-ended or the second? Yeah. yeah, you yeah. Know? Uh, well, and that's a great, and, uh, that's a super question. So there, are, I, I would have two, two answers to it. One is um, again, our experience at St. Vlad's is that our programs function on a cohort model and uh, boy, when you, when you work on a cohort model, you really uh, have greased the skids for building community because you can basically dedicate an entire, you know, six week mandatory orientation program that's just focused on that. Um, the, the sole outcome is to help people get to know each other and start to be, start to trust one another, share some stories, whatnot. And then every single class that they have, they're dealing with the same group of colleagues. Um, now, the danger is that the, you, whatever group you have, that's, that's the only kind of exposure you get. But I think the positive side is by the end of the program, let's say in, a, in our DMIN program, students do eight core courses together. Boy, by the, by the last couple core courses, those, co those cohorts tend to be firing on all eight cylinders because there's such a level of understanding and trust and they know who each other are. Um, so when you, when you, if you, if you, if it's possible, I think, to actually set up a program to emphasize building communities of teachers and learners. Um, uh, and, and that way you don't have to struggle so much with rebuilding it in every single course. Um, uh, if you do it, if you, so, so basically if a course is just a one-off and you have a new, uh, a new cohort of students for that specific class, um, then yeah, I would say that the first two or three weeks Again, you have to be dealing with content because you just can't say, okay, we're not going to do content until week four. But I would say really intentionally design all the questions related to content, related to the work of the course, related to those specific course outcomes. Design those questions, design those discussions to maximize the, the, uh, the personal component um, and also the collaborative uh, component. In what way are we all working together? So. Cool. All right, let me go on to my last slide. Um, so the... Um, Thank you for that, by the way. Um, oh, pleasure. I was about to say that, but then I realized I was still on mute, so I just came over and unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here, vulnerability and trust. So here are some ideas. All right, I've already mentioned, and Sebastian, you had that great question, you know, that the, that the teacher really can lead by example. So teachers serve as facilitators and guides who seek deeper knowledge as part of the process. This is something that I really, and I'm not, I mean, I'm first among sinners here. Um, I don't always do this, but, but I, I'm, constant, I'm trying to always remind myself of this, is when I go into the classroom and when I'm engaging with students, of course, I have, you know, the reason I'm there is because I have a particular expertise. And there is something, there is some expertise that I have that I can um, share with the students. So that's, that's real. On the other hand, I have to constantly remind myself, or I want to be constantly aware that I am a, a fellow traveler in the process, meaning that every class, every course, every class session, you know, every, every kind of question and answer engagement is an opportunity for me to learn more about this particular topic. Um, and I think the more that I go into the process with that awareness, I think the better that my students are going to, the better experience my students are going to have. Because I think what really shuts it down is when I sit back and say, Okay, I'm the expert. I know everything. You know, your job is simply to pay, pray, and obey. And at the end of the course, you know, uh, parrot back all the expertise that I've shared with you. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty uh, uh, lifeless. Um, but if I'm saying, you know, okay, I've got some expertise here, but I am looking forward to growing in my ability, to growing in my expertise. Um, I mean, my area is homiletics. Um, so I think about it, art and craft. So, you know, I think every time I teach a class, I have an opportunity to learn more about the, about the subject, to become a better preacher, to learn more about rhetorical technique and strategy. So that would be the first thing. Um, and I started with, you know, bullet three, because Sebastian, you asked that excellent question. Um, so then another one is, um, you know, 
uh, and this is more broadly, you know, and it's more of like a, how you might open up a, a, a session, whether that be an orientation for um, a program that uses a model or to begin a, a class session where you're trying to form a new community. Um, you know, you could ask this question, and this is a little, this is a little radical, I admit. Um, you could say, what, and you, again, you would start off with your own story, but you could ask, what is the weakness, tragedy, or insecurity that motivated you to enter theological studies or helped to reveal your vocation? I know that's kind of a radical question, um, but my experience, having taught in seminaries for almost 20 years now, is that I don't think I've ever met a, a, a theological student um, who is doing their studies because some expert, some bishop or something came and said, you know, Sergius, you are just, you know, a pious, full, highly intellectual person. You need to be at seminary. I mean, of course, you have those people along the way that motivate you. But fundamentally, there's some, I don't know, there's, there's a weakness. There, there's the, the student, most of the students that I know, um, and people don't like to talk about this, right, because we always want to look good. Um, but, you know, I would be willing, and I'll just I'll share with you right now, you know, probably one of the primary motivating factors that led me to theological study and really helped me to discern a vocation um, was the dramatic disintegration of my family. Um, you know, when I was, uh, after my first year at college, I came home and my parents were separated and like no one was talking about it. You know, dad was living in the camp, mom was living in the house. It's like, what's going on? And, and, and it was this dramatic disintegration of the family, which really, I mean, totally upended my entire life. Um, and it was, I wasn't a Christian at the time. It was primarily by encountering um, the love and the mercy um, and the communion of, of, of brothers and sisters in Christ that, that really, uh, opened my eyes and, and changed my entire life. Um, now, I share that with you, not to say that that's the only way that one can come to faith or, or, or uh, discover a vocation, um, but I think it's really important to remember that we come to this work, again, this is within, with theology, within a, a framework of, of Christian uh, education, um, and it's, I think it would be possible to do it in some ways even more outside of that, even if you, if you weren't teaching in a, in a seminary or theological school. But for now, let's just say we're in a theological school, um, that ultimately we come to our vocation, we come to our ministry, whatever it might be, uh, somehow motivated by weakness. Um, and certainly there's that great line, you know, where the Lord says to Paul, you know, strength is made perfect in your weakness. Um, this whole idea of the wounded or repentant healer. I mean, Peter, uh, you know, just went through Holy Week and Pascha. You know, Peter had his great failing, you know, Paul, Saul, and then Paul, he went through his great feeling, uh, failing. Um, in our Eastern Christian tradition, we have this famous um, uh, Saint Mary of Egypt who started her life as an incredibly um, sinful, uh, weak person, only to end up as this revered ascetic. Um, anyway, uh, I think that's an important, or that's a, 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 from, a the, from a Christian theological perspective, uh, that's a powerful way to approach this, um, to basically uh, uh, ground it um, in scripture, as opposed to just saying, well, there's this crazy professor, and he thinks we should talk about weakness and vulnerability. Um, so that would be a, a kind of an idea as to how we might uh, enter into it in a way that um, has a bit of authority, that, uh, and, it, and it appeals to an authority that, that would be shared among the community. Um, also, um, the last bullet here is the idea of critical method, um, acknowledging the conventional uh, factors, these non-negotiable factors, um, really be willing to embrace the variables. Um, so what are the variables within that framework of kind of doctrinal affirmation or creedal assertions or whatever it might be? What are the variables? There are many variables within that. So embrace those as, as areas for exploration and discovery, and then also to challenge assumptions, challenge my own assumptions, right? Constantly come back. One of the phrases that I use, I think I've even used it a couple times in this talk, but I use it in the classroom, is I'll throw something out, but I'll preface it by saying, now this is my opinion, and I think it's true, but if you don't think it's right, please let me know, because if I'm wrong, I want to know, and then I'll preface it that way, and I'll throw it out, um, and then, you know, occasionally someone will come up with a really great challenge to it, and I'll say, you know, that's exactly what I was looking for, so, um, so anyway, these are, this is certainly not exhaustive, um, the, just a couple ideas for, for strategically, kind of, uh, method, in terms of methodology and strategy, how we might work in this way. Um, but uh, like I said at the very beginning, 
of, of these slides. Um, this is totally a work in progress. Okay, so that's the end of my slides, my slide deck. I'm gonna stop sharing and just go back to a picture and say, all right, what are some thoughts and ideas? Uh, what do you think of this? Am I crazy or, or is there something here? Uh, Sergius, my name is Tim Westbrook. I, I know, I think almost everybody else in the group, but I don't know if we've met before. If we haven't. It's good to meet you, Tim. See, it's good to meet you. Um, and I appreciate your thoughts. And I'm, I'm in a, I think we're on the same, on the same side of this, this conversation. Uh, there's a, there's a chapter by now and written in 1971 where he talks about uh, redemptive teaching. And, and I've got that, I've got a PDF copy that I could be glad to share it if, even if it's not violating copyright laws. But anyway, now and, uh, and, and, and I'll, I'll get the title later. But anyway, he, he challenges some of those traditional ways of teaching that are fear-based, you know, kind of a heavy power distance from the hierarchical structure that you've talked about. And, and I think it's a, a fantastic way of, of, of re-envisioning what it, what it means, especially as theological educators who... who um, uh, ought we be stuck in a medieval type of educational structure or should we be thinking about uh, more along the lines of <laughs> to use a kind of a popular an outdated popular expression what would Jesus do in this situation to educate his disciples uh, and so anyway that's th those are my thoughts on that and, and I do see um, I see faculty who are used to teaching younger adults that are comfortable with their um, kind of condescending approach towards education, applying that same model to teaching people who are the same age as they are. And that simply is not going to work. That's, that's not a way to win friends and influence people <laughs> in our, in our uh, adult learning programs. Anyway, that, that's all I've got. Thanks for, thanks for your comments today. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have to say that uh, Henry Nowen, um so I live in New Haven, um, and I go to the Yale Divinity School Library quite often. Um, and on the windowsill, maybe I can even find it as we're talking, uh, on the windowsill of the, when you go into the library, there are these, some of these really unusual and striking statues, little statues um, that actually were a gift from, uh, from uh, Henry um, uh, that he gave to the school when he, when he left. But uh, there's still a really strong sense, at least at the Div School, of the community that he built. I mean, he was such a builder of community. And the more that I get to know about him, um, the more it's kind of striking. So thank you. Thank you for that reference. I'll see if I can, if I can look it up. Um, tell me again, what was the name of the piece? It was what, Redemptive I, I, Learning. I'll, I'll find it and I'll share it in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. We've had some other people join. Um, as you see, uh, Tim uh, is there. Um, so uh, does anybody else have any other thoughts or any other questions concerning this? I know I've got a whole sheet of them that I've been writing down while uh, Father Sergius was talking, but not to hog the room. Um, I uh, appreciated the discussion, and it was taken from a different view of how to establish community, but I'm also wondering how you might, and maybe other people have ideas, I have some, but I don't know that they'll work, not having tried them, but how do you um, talk about this in the way that you just did? to be able to get people to understand in a quick way, you know, you don't want to spend an hour, um, you know, you know, talking about it in, 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 a, in a class perhaps. But um, I, I really wonder if there's other ways that people have uh, created this sense of uh, vulnerability and um, this sense that we're all equal. I love the scriptures that you used. I would love to have a copy of your PowerPoint just because um, I think this adds to any discussion that if you're talking about community. And it's not uh, an approach that I've looked at um, too, too much. I'm glad that many of you have and I appreciate it. Thanks for sharing. Thanks, Phyllis. I will, um, I'm going to make one modification to the slide deck. I have to, I realized that, that I need to put in there, you know, maintaining appropriate boundaries is really essential. Um, but once I fix that, then um, yeah, I'll, I'll email, uh, I'll email you the slide deck. Um, my, my pleasure. Because, you know, all those images are in the public domain. Thank you, Sebastian. <laughs> Very cool. And when we get the slide deck, um, Father Sergius will post it on the, um, 
on distancelearningdirectors.org for those uh, who will be uh, viewing this on demand later. So, um, so I've got a, another question for you, uh, and that is, um, in terms of uh, engaging students and community, uh, it's sometimes the case that students say, hey, I didn't come here to learn from uh, uh, these other people in my class because basically we're just uh, sharing ignorance with one another. I came here to learn from the experts, so I want that voice of authority, and I want that alone. You know, I, my neighbors uh, to the left and to the right of me in the video chat, uh, maybe that person isn't a voice of authority, and therefore I'm just wasting my time. There's an attitude about that uh, that I once had to deal with. Um, how would you respond? Well, that's a great question. So let me just share an anecdote that I think uh, <laughs> perfectly describes that. My, uh, one of my beloved professors, uh, Father Thomas Topko, who was Dean of St. Vladimir's. And um, if, you, if you Google him up, he's like, was this uh, unbelievable podcaster. He just made all these podcasts um, uh, right up to the end of his life. Anyway, um, he had all these great stories. And one of his stories was he was talking with his mom. His mom was quite old at the time. And, um, uh, and she and he said, what are you doing? I said, oh, well, you know, we're doing this and that. And he said, well, how's, how's life in the, in the parish? And she said, oh, it's very fine. You know, we're, we're, I mean, we're doing this Bible study. Um, and he said, oh, your Bible study. Well, what, um, what, what, uh, what book of the Bible are you reading? And she said, um, I don't know, I think she said, we're, um, uh, we're reading the book of, of, of Ezekiel or something like that. And he said, wow, book of Ezekiel, that's really, you know, that's great. That's a super important book, but it's really challenging. I mean, especially at the beginning, there's all this imagery and it's quite unusual. You know, how, how do you, how do you deal with that? She says, oh, we, it's quite easy. You know, the places that we don't understand, we just explain it to each other. <laughs> so, you know, it's this idea, right? It's like, well, people just make stuff up, you know? Oh. So that's, it's a great, it's a great point that, 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 there's, and again, it's, it's kind of getting back to my slide, this, the, the risk of anti-intellectualism. And I think, you know, if a student had that kind of response, again, my, my strategy as a teacher is always to kind of employ a judo response. Um, so first of all, to recognize the validity of their concern, you know, like, okay, your concern here is really important. You know, you, you want to make sure you're getting, um, you know, expertise. And then I would, I would just try to clarify um, to say that, the point here is not that we are suddenly saying everyone's opinion in the class is necessarily equal, or we're not saying that everyone in the class, just by nature of having enrolled in this course, is now an expert. But what we can do is, at the, right at the beginning, we can say that everyone in this class is a unique person who is going to hear what I have to say. So like, if I'm a student, right, I would say or let's say you're a student, Sebastian, I would say now everyone in this class uh, has a unique, is going to have a unique perspective on what you say. So let's say if you're going to explain, you know, the mystery of the Trinity in 300 words or less, um, everyone, that's a ridiculous example, um, but, you know, everyone here who's going to read your piece or listen to your, your podcast or, or watch your video or whatever is going to have a unique way of interpreting that. And they're going to have unique kind of challenges or there are going to be things that they don't understand or concerns that might arise. And each one of them, each one of those concerns is going to be totally valid because when you go out into your ministry and when you're basically teaching this or when you're writing, you're going to be writing for a community of people like this and even broader. And so what you're, what one of, the, one of the things, and there are many other things, but one of the things you're going to get from this experience is how do other people hear your work? How do other people respond to your argument, to, to your presentation of ideas? Um, so right off the bat, it's not, it's not so much an expertise, but it's, it's a point of feedback that can be incredibly helpful because of course, everything makes perfect sense in my mind about what I say. You know, when I, when I write an essay, of course it makes perfect sense to me um, because I, I, I make up for all the gaps in between my arguments. So, so that would be one way so I guess the, the, the idea, sorry, I'm rambling here, but the idea would be to be really explicit about what it is that your, your kind of peers, your, your, your fellow classmates offer in terms of the critical process and not to mess that up, right? Like, you know, uh, you know, say I, as the professor, I have a particular expertise here. I can give you that. I can also, I can also put you on the trail to a number of other experts who are 
vastly more knowledgeable than I in terms of the reading, the homework, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but then to be to be clear about exactly what kind of kind of lowercase e expertise um, your classmates might have in the overall process. Maybe someone else has a better idea about, about how to answer Sebastian's question. So answer Sebastian's great question than what I just kind of said. I'd like to just bring up the whole epistemological differences that we're talking about. There's a, um, another person that I know who uh, we got into a discussion about moving his class online and uh, the, 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 the idea was made by this individual that he would rather his class not be taught at all than be taught online. And, and I thought that was a really unfortunate and bold statement to make, to the thought that uh, it, it can't happen online at a quality high enough for it to justify teaching the class in the first place. And the more, I, the more I reflected on this, and I was, I was kind of offended by that, uh, the more I reflected on it, the more I realized we're coming from a very different epistemological background. And, and if I'm looking at it from more of a constructivistic perspective, and he's looking at it from more of a perennial perspective, he's seeing that, that his subject matter is, that the, the knowledge of that subject matter is passed down from one person to the next, and the gatekeepers of that knowledge are the, are the faculty and the experts. Of course, from the constructivistic perspective, knowledge is, um, knowledge is out there just waiting to be discovered. And we're all approaching that from, from the same, uh, we're, we're approaching it from different perspectives, but we're looking at the same thing. And so what can we gain by looking at that same thing from different perspectives? And, and that, that gap in those two points of view uh, really do um, create some of the, the tensions that we feel um, you know, it, it's, I witnessed this morning conversation with students reflecting on, small groups reflecting on a passage of scripture, and about 20% of what they had to say was accurate. The rest was um, just showing that they haven't looked at this as much as other people have. But it gave me an opportunity to come, come back and, and um, help guide the conversation as a participant. If I were to say, you and your small groups discuss this and that's your grade for the day without any further guidance, then I'm failing as a, as a coach or as a teacher in the classroom. But if I take what they had to say and use that as ways to hook new ideas on to for them, then that I think, um, and going back to Sebastian's statement, I think that's what our jobs, that, that is our job as the facilitator, teacher, coach, whatever we're calling ourselves in an online classroom, not to pool the ignorance, but to comb the, <laughs> comb the ignorance for those teachable moments and then step in and make the difference. Um, the other thing, you know, this is interesting. So thank you, Tim. That's the great, super, super observation. Um, another thing, you know, that's, I, again, I, and I come from this, I come at this from a, a particularly artistic perspective in that I teach homiletics, right? Where students, the students are not simply like reading text and trying to like, you know, glean out the top, top, top five, you know, most critical points and, you know, get the A plus because they got relevant bits, but rather to really learn a craft, to basically craft a word, you know, craft a message that, that can be relevant and important for, for all the hearers. So one of the things that and I, what, I, sorry, that was a long intro. I'm, I'm teeing off on your comment about, um, uh, you know, there, there's the ignorance, and then there's the kind of the gleaning those, those bits of insight from the ignorance. Uh, I would say that actually the kind of ignorant, obviously, you know, sometimes students just say stuff because they're, they, well, I have to fill in a, a, a thread discussion and I haven't done the homework. Of course, there's always that. But a lot of, I think, at a certain level, you can make the case that in order for the in, to have the insights, you have to have a, a certain number of expressions of ignorance. It's like, it's like part of the process. So it's not like, oh, gosh, we had, you know, we had 10 ignorant uh, 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 expressions and then one, you know, really insightful one. No, actually, you could probably make the case that those 10 ignorant ideas or, you know, you didn't quite miss the point there or whatever, those are actually part of that process in ultimately drilling down to something that's deeply insightful. I don't know, does, it, does that make sense? It's almost like drafts, you know, like, like what, what great novelist, you know, ever, ever hit the, you know, hit the perfect novel, you know, on the first draft, 
draft. You know, you had a number of different times you had to work through it. So, so I think that's also a really critical, and I know I struggle with this too, because again, getting back to the idea of assessment, like without just saying, oh, you get an A because you tried, or, you know, everyone gets, you know, gets a trophy for participation. Um, how do you make a valid assessment to say, all right, you were, um, uh, you took the chance to put something out there, even, even if it wasn't correct, you did, the, you did the work required to actually make an argument. And so now you're going to, you're going to receive credit for having made an argument, even though, you know, you got 10 really important critiques about why the argument doesn't hold up. Um, so I think that's an interesting, I don't have a perfect, I don't have a good answer for that, but I think that's a really important thing as a teacher to be able to provide a student with assessment to say, okay, you are actually, you know, demonstrating that you're doing the kind of hard draftsman or draftsperson's work required to ultimately get something that's, that's worth reading or worth hearing. I think that's a great point, um, uh, Father, uh, in terms of uh, ways in which to um, evaluate student contributions. Uh, not every contribution um, is one that's scorable uh, in terms of a grade, but is uh, scorable in terms of completion and in terms of uh, the way in which the student engages it. So even if the student is wrong on um, some kind of post that he or she has made, uh, the uh, opportunity for dialogue in um, in coming to an awareness of the uh, points uh, over the course of the post, uh, where the student stepped from one direction or another uh, off the track and just ended up uh, uh, going down the rabbit hole, as it were. Um, so I, the, the total experience is the student has had the opportunity to engage the question, and then the the assessment where it uh, really counts for. Um, uh, the student learning outcome, perhaps, if you're trying to, uh, uh, to uh, measure a student's uh, capacity to perform in a certain level, uh, would come with, the, um, would come with uh, the project the student turns in or the, uh, the midterm or the, um, the term paper, or whatever uh, the accountability exercises would be, that would be a larger, uh, more significant portion of the grade. So uh, in a, a class I teach, uh, if a student, uh, based on student posts, the student gets a, a, a small percentage or smaller percentage for posting um, in the discussion area, then that student would get in um, uh, performing the, uh, the major project of the course or the semester project. Another thing, too, is uh, there's, and I don't, I don't always do this well, um, but uh, another Another, another, if you can set it up, would be to, to have somebody, you know, put out a draft and then you'd have, you'd, you'd have a way of saying, okay, is it, is it evident that you've put some thought into this, right? You know, even, even if you're wrong, um, did you put some thought into it? Um, and then you could basically, that would be the sim simply, that's the only thing we're looking for, that you put some thought into this. And then, you know, everyone comes, the professor and all the colleagues then put in, you know, constructive, supportive critique. I mean, edgy stuff, right? You know, this is correct here, this is correct, da, 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 da. And then ultimately the final assessment or part of the final assessment would be the ability of the student to integrate the critique and the, um, uh, the, the critical analysis that the professor and all other colleagues provided on the draft. Um, that would be a really, I think, a valuable assessment, you know, to assess the student's ability to implement, to constructively implement um, constructive criticism. Sorry, that's a bit redundant. I like the idea um, uh, in terms of the student integrating constructive feedback into the final product. I mean, that's uh, every uh, course uh, in, is now based uh, because of our assessment structures on whether the artifacts enable the student to demonstrate whether he or she is meeting the student learning outcomes. Um, the things that we said at the end of the class, you'll be able to do these things. Well, can they? Um, one of those uh, should be at least an implicit one in all courses is capacity for critical thought uh, and engagement of the diverse opinions of others, um, uh, in particular of um, uh, the ability to integrate uh, those um, uh, the, the feedback into a, a final project. I mean, that, that's uh, 
if a student has a master's program and there's 12 courses where all of those expectations are laid out across the 12 courses, that student's going to come out the other end of the degree program uh, much uh, more competent and able to engage uh, the discipline uh, or others within the discipline in which he or she has been trained. Um, thinking about um, just back to the presentation that I gave um, the last time um, on this idea of community, everyone seems to have a different goal in their discussion forums, and not all of it is attributed to community. Some of it's contributed to meeting learning objectives or, or um, you know, checking off a box, they did the homework, they read it, whatever. And, and so uh, I, I guess this piece adds a different dimension to how you're gonna get people to respond in the discussion forums or in any activity where there's engagement rather than just uploading an assignment or something of that nature. So I, I think this kind of well rounds out uh, better uh, the approach to discussion forums or any kind of interactive assignment. Just my thoughts. No, thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, we have uh, three minutes left uh, before the end of the hour. Um, are there any final thoughts um, that anybody else would like to advance? Uh, uh, and then Father Serge, um, uh, any concluding remarks from you? And then uh, uh, we'll ask you to lead us in a prayer and that'll be uh, the end of our time together. I, I wouldn't mind contributing. Uh, uh, in, in the first slide, Father Serge, we, we talked about the hierarchy relationship versus the uh, community sort of yeah yeah uh, from, my, from my experience in 20 years at Holy Apostles uh, the the main reason people drop out of courses I think is uh, due to um, not having a sense of community and being able to participate and just being feeling like they're just regurgitating what they're being taught so there are some students who want to just hear it from straight from the expert but most students want to participate in a dialogue. That's been my experience. Thank you. This was very good. No, thanks, Bob. I mean, that's, you are, in a way, you're the gold standard in terms of having your finger on the pulse of the students. I mean, having, having dealt with students in distance learning program, uh, programs or uh, a program for, for two, two decades, I mean, that's remarkable. So thank you. Thank you. For thank you. That's what we call the front lines of engagement where Bob is. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. All right. Oh, Sebastian, you muted yourself, right? Oh, sorry, your lips no, moved. Yeah. Um, uh, concluding remarks from you. Oh, let's see. Well, I would just, I would just want, I, I would say thank you very much to everyone who joined in and everyone who participated in the discussion. Um, you know, these these encounters that we have are opportunities for us to to grow as a community, um, and that's great. Um, especially, you know, in these days, uh, anything we can do to, to build the bonds of friendship and uh, in, in the love of Christ, um, uh, in God's love, I think are, are absolutely priceless. Uh, so thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for your great questions. Um, and I will uh, I'll make a little modification to the slide deck and I will, I'll set it out. So if anyone's watching this recording, um, my, I'll have my uh, email address in the uh, slide deck as well. And so I welcome your your comments and your, your thoughts and your critical feedback uh, to make my work even better. So thank you. Um, and I will finish with a prayer. This is incredibly brief. Um, as an Eastern Orthodox priest, you might say, wait, Eastern Orthodox bre brevity? I mean, those two don't seem to go together. Um, we're in Bright Week. This is our Paschal Bright Week. We just celebrated our Easter on Sunday. So this is, this is the Paschal hymn. I, I won't sing it. I'll just say it. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. In the name of the Father, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you all. Thank you so very much, Father Sergis. Uh, this will be posted uh, later on this afternoon, and uh, uh, thank you uh, for being here and for sharing with us your wisdom. Uh, Always a pleasure. For, for those interested in coming to a listening session on Friday, we'll be doing this again at the same time, Friday afternoon, using the same link. All right. God bless everyone.